hello, uh, hello. D- Dietmar. Uh, thank you for uh, agreeing on doing this uh, podcast with me. Uh, so I have a few things I want to talk about, and um, maybe you can um, we can start with this uh, famous quote we have on uh, on our T-shirts: uh, "Strength is the mother of all qualities." Um, I know similar quotes have been thrown around by different coaches like Medvedev or Bompa. And you, um, I just want to know who said this first. Who said strength is a matter of qual- all qualities as, as the first person? <laughs> Was it I'm you? Not, no, <laughs> I'm not sure about that. But it, uh, I think in any case, it would be uh, a knowledge mm-hmm. which comes up more than 100, 150 years ago. Mm-hmm. So I'm not sure about uh, the people who did that. But I'm quite sure that there are some of the guys Uh, become very famous. Uh, One of them was an an Austrian coach who who made the experience that a lot of ballet people, female and male, get a lot of problems with the lower back pain. And then he started to develop something to prevent this. And what he did was very clear strength training. And this was 1905 or 1906, wow. so 120 years ago. Mm-hmm. And then some people come up and um, showed something like the beginning of bodybuilding. And they traveled around the world, earned a lot of money. But even these guys I mentioned were followers of circus people who told the others, we were strong enough to catch the shot of canyons and things like that. So they make show. Right. But the other one I mentioned, they really worked with the strength training and they had a good benefit. Mm-hmm. What, do you remember what year did you start using this quote? What, what year was it when you said it first? Was it 50 years ago, 30 years ago, when you started saying strength is the mother of all qualities? I, I learned it from my professor. Mm-hmm. And this was... Uh, 1970. Was it, it more than 50 years ago? More than 50 years ago. Wow. Um, I wanted one of my um, personal mentors and people I learned from uh, was Charles Palaquin, mm-hmm. and I know uh, he mentioned on several occasions that when he was younger, he would travel the world to see some of these uh, coaches like Pavel Komi and yeah. Dietmar Schmidblesher. Uh, could you tell us more about? The meeting with him, uh, he, there was a, how many times did he come to see you? Was it once? And what did he want to know? And what year was it when he came to see you? Oh, I'm not sure about that. But such a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the background was that my professor was originally a participant in the Olympics of the 60s. He was a shot putter. And uh, I know exactly that he mentioned. Uh, in the 70s that a lot of coaches said uh, we just need good coordinations. We, we, it's not necessary to, ha- to have too much strength. If coordination is good enough, it works. But the problem is, like in a race car, if you have a very good coordination of the different parts of the muscle, but the motor is too weak, nothing will happen. And his idea always was, if you're strong enough, this is the basic element. It, it's not all. It's not for winning, but it's the basic element, and that's what you say here. It's the mother of all qualities. And uh, <clears throat> I traveled then around till the end of the 70s all over the world with a lot of coaches. Famous ones, not so famous ones. Arthur's was in Canada. And so the coach of, of uh, Bengt Johnson and those people who said, oh, I do strength training, but we, we had an, additionally, yeah. we had some medicaments to increase and said, oh, that's a different, but I, I can tell something about that. We, we don't work with this. But finally, I cannot remember on, on single persons and of some of them, I'm not willing to remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's been too many. No. It's been too many of them. 
No, not because of that. <laughs> but they, when I said it, <laughs> they were <laughs> they were really. Uh, can, can you can you explain? The coach asked me why we don't have Olympic winners in javelin, in shot put, in hammer throwing, and these are not black people. And I said no idea about that because we in Central Europe. We, we, we have no idea, no statistics from that, what happened there. And he was a very famous American coach. That's the point why I don't mention the name. Mm -hmm. And I said, can you probably give me an explanation why? And then he was laughing. He said, these people <laughs> are not intelligent enough, Bob. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, um we finished our seminar yesterday and and some of the things we touched upon is strength training for uh for our endurance sports and yeah. i want to ask you i mean is it necessary to do any type of endurance training in a weight room for athletes that maybe do sprints or do like speed skating and then maybe boxing or soccer and obviously going further going like to marathon mm -hmm. running and stuff like that can you touch upon some of these things? Because, I mean, some coaches do endurance training with speed skaters, for example, when the event lasts 60 seconds or yeah. 120 seconds, but they still do like long distance biking, saying that it helps with, the, with their uh, VO2 max or it helps with recovery. And yeah. like all these coaches still do that, even though the sports only last a few seconds or yeah, maybe 60 yeah, seconds. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine where the story does come from. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late 70s, there was the idea that you can increase your performance capability in doing endurance type sports. Some extreme coaches tell you, you have to run 10,000 meters when you're a sprinter. And you ask them, uh, you think that's okay, because this is only 10, 11, 12 seconds what they are doing, but why, why should they do endurance exercises? And the answer was, if you do endurance type exercises, you can do more exercises. You will not get fatigued so fast. That was the idea. And we know that it was nonsense. Because at that time, the coaches and even the scientists are not sure about the adaptation of the different muscle fiber types. So they did not know if you run for too long time that you will have an adaptation on the slow, slow twitch muscle fibers. So, in fact, if they do this, this was a wrong decision. And later on, the idea to do something for endurance was coming just from the opposite side from the bodybuilding people because they said if we do a lot of bodybuilding and then we had depending on on the development uh, <coughs> of our exercises uh, we get problems with the heart right. because it, it, you get a, a lot of water outside and uh, in that case your heart becomes a problem. So even these guys said we use a bike or uh, uh, an ergometer, something like that. But this was a prevention because of heart disease to, to avoid mm -hmm. heart disease problems. It's a different thing. Nowadays, I would say it makes for, a, for a speed sports it makes not sense to do any type of exercise. Vice versa, it's, it's good. Because a lot of the endurance type athletes, they have a lot of resources of fast twitch activation, not fast twitch fibers, but fast twitch activation from the nervous system. And they had resources of 25, 30%, like untrained people, if you, for example, go for electrical stimulation, 
you can get maximal strength by electrolyte stimulation increasing by 25 to 30% in endurance sports, in untrained people also, in elderly people up to 40%. But in well-trained athletes who are working for speed and power, there's only three to 4%, not more. And that's the reason why for these endurance guys, strength training makes sense. So be more beneficial for endurance sports to do strength training than to do additional endurance training. Right. Even for like l really long distance, like marathon runners. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's the point. <laughs> they have, these marathon runners have resources because they do all the time these, these long lasting exercises. So they had changes from the fiber type from fast twitch to slow twitch, or from fast twitch maybe to a smaller pound of, of uh, uh, fibers who are fatigue resistant. But definitely the 2X fibers, the fastest, they disappear. They disappear, and the problem is we, we focus on this muscle and on this fiber type. But in fact, that's what I showed yesterday, is that we have a combination of n neuronal activation and muscular adaptation. Both together are a unit. And if you kick out stimuli which are directed on endurance, then you also kick out stimuli for fast activation from the nervous system. So your nervous system did not learn to work as fast and explosive as possible. And then the fiber type changes and still the problem is you have no more possibilities from the point of view of the muscle to produce fast contractions. But you have still a possibility from your nervous system. So your nervous system can activate faster. And now, if you do any type of strength training, you become this back and you can activate faster. To be more precise, these guys should do a type of strength training which is mainly directed to the nervous system. With other words, a strength training for long-lasting endurance event people should be explosive, short and extremely heavy. That's the point. And not, and not a strength training with a lot of reps and a lot of sets and a long duration. And that's the reason why some of the coaches said, oh, we checked it, but it did not work. They make the wrong type of strength training. That's the point. Right. So, because from my experience, when I deal with like soccer coaches or boxing coaches, they all want to do like circuit training yes. for time, a lot of reps, a lot of sets, short rest periods, because they say uh, strength training makes them tight or makes them slow uh, for some reason. And that's not true. Right. I mean, strength training, if you, if you <laughs> use heavy weight up to 90, like 90% 90 yeah. above, yeah. there's no way to, I mean, yeah, maybe they are right because they do a type of strength training who makes you fatigue and slow. Right. right. And in, in sometimes you learn, let's say, strange things. I remember I was one, one day I was in a, in a rehab center and it, it was in a, in a big stadium, in, in a soccer stadium. And uh, during the rest interval, uh, I was walking around and I saw some professional uh, football players uh, running. Mm -hmm. And they were running from one end of the field to the other one and back. And I was looking for 10 minutes and then finally, I, the, as the coach was coming, and uh, he, he knows me, he said, hello. I said, I said, can you explain why you do this? Ah, that's good for the players. I said, why? I, I, I cannot remember any soccer match 
in which the players are running from one end of the field to the other one and back. That's too long. And that's, it makes no sense because it will not happen. And if it happens in 100 years, maybe twice, not, not very often, why do you do that? And then he said, um, all other coaches do it. I said, that's not, that's not a good answer. And then he was going away. Some minutes later, he was coming back. I said, I know why we do it. Ah, I said, okay, let me know. He said, look around. He said, yeah. A lot of old people are here and uh, visiting the, the soccer players, what they are doing. I said, right. And we have to demonstrate that these people who earn such a lot of money, they have to work for this money. Otherwise, no one could accept why they get such a lot of money and they don't do anything. <laughs> so that the rationale behind this, uh, maybe a psychological one, not right. a physiological. Yeah. So, and when I remember when we were in uh, Stuttgart, you said that, you said this um, sentence is, and, and it's, it reads, high maximal force transfers to small loads velocity, meaning yeah. high intensity training or like 90% above will transfer to speed and, and power and yeah, rate right. of force development. And that's correct. That's quite clear. It's, it's very easy to understand. If you work against very high loads in an explosive type, it means against high loads as fast as possible you have an extremely high contraction velocity. You have not a high movement velocity. That's what I demonstrated on the wall. If you press against the wall, you can do this very explosive and you can do this very slow. The movement velocity of the wall in both cases is zero. But the contraction velocity, if you do it very explosive, is very high. Now, if you bring away the wall, and you have a small load and you have a high contraction velocity against a small load, this small load will move extremely fast. And the problem is, let's say for javelin throwing, throwing a ball, kicking, shot put, whatever it is, if, <coughs> if you work with an athlete and you tell him, make it, make it with a lot of strength. This will not happen. That's the wrong, the wrong order. The point would be, make it as fast as possible. That's it. And the precondition to be as fast as possible is that you are able to do that. And if you want to improve it, you have to work explosive against high loads. So you get it. That was my recommendation. Perfect. Mm. <coughs> and we, we, we touched about uh, muscle fiber types. And uh, just to clear things up, you can actually, uh, the, the slow twitch fibers cannot transition to be fast twitch, but fast twitch can actually become slow twitch, which is right. not favorable for, for the athletes and for, for the people overall. So if you're doing too much endurance training, like let's say you play soccer and then you go in a weight room and you do endurance in the weight room and you do endurance after practice, you actually can become more slow twitch and mm -hmm. become more slower and less powerful. Is that true? Yeah. It's true from scientific point of view. It's true because it was shown very often. It was checked also with animals. And finally, it's true from, let's say, statistics and observations over the last three or four decades. If you remember, if there is a world uh, championship in soccer, sometimes the TV shows you pictures from one of the last world championships. And of course, in Germany, they show you pictures when Germany was become world champion. 
Right. So then you see pictures from from probably 1954, first time at Bern at that time. Then from the 70s, from the early 90s, with Beckenbauer and these guys who become world championships. If you look how they played at that time, then from nowadays, when you look on soccer games today, and then you look on these old films, your ideas, hey, what about these guys? Are they drunken? <laughs> are they tired? Had they took medicaments? Why are they so slow? And that's exactly the point. They did such a lot of endurance type exercise that they were not able to become really fast. And one interesting point was um, three months before the, the World Soccer, the, the, the Soccer Championship 2006, the coaches uh, have invited us, uh, my team and myself, to demonstrate how to do strength training. And then they said, we will do this for the national soccer team for the championship. I said, forget it. It's half a year before. You will not have a chance within half a year to change what you have made wrong for 15 years. <laughs> and by the way, if you say, okay, we will change the fiber type, we will change the capability of the soccer players that they become faster, that's a good decision. But that means from Consequently, from logical point of view, you have to do this not with the top players now. You have to do this with the youngsters in the age of 14 or 15 years. They have two or three years time to become really fast and then become members of the national team. They will become fast. And by the way, if you have a team with soccer players who are much faster than those you have in the moment, you have to change your tactical concept. They play other. Right. They play fast. They play powerful. So the idea is not all play the same over 90 minutes. The idea is a lot of them block behind and the other one attack in front. And then you change. And the logical consequence would be if this idea is successful and it's successful for the next 20 years, I'm, I easily can predict what will happen. You have to change the rules. You have to change the rules because then you have a lot of athletes who are extremely fast mm -hmm. and it's not possible to play with the whole team over these 90 minutes. So the rules must be in future that you say not only three players or five players can change during the match, maybe 50%. Right. Because the extremely fast you take out after half an hour and then you bring the next one, like in handball. Exactly. Um, when those athletes become faster and stronger, is it, do they, do they increase? Because the notion is that some people say the athletes, for example, in soccer got faster so the risk of injury for like hamstring injury is, 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 is more and there's more hamstring injuries. And overall, like when you look at the sports, it seems like there are more and more injuries now than they were before. Is it, what do you think is the cause of that and what's, how, how, how can we prevent it from, from becoming a problem? That's a difficult question because yeah. it depends what's the meaning of the coach. And what's what's the necessity to fulfill the economic aspects? First of all, uh, if you increase the speed by ex increasing the power capability of extensors, you also must increase the strength capability of the flexors. Otherwise you get an imbalance. That's one point. The other point is that the number of injuries 
increases by factor 3, especially in the knee and in the joint, dramatically over the last 10 years. There are clear statistics from FIFA. But the interesting point is that the increase of these injuries not occur during the match. The injuries number increased during your exercise players, playings and, and your competitions during exercise, not in the match itself. Well. And that means there is obviously an overload, so the coach are doing too much. And especially they remember to old type of exercises who increase the metabolic tolerance extremely. So if the order is to have short time, fast runnings, forward, backward, forward, backward, forward, backward, for let's say first 10 minutes when the match begins to make a lot of pressure that produces a lot of lactate. So you need a higher metabolic capacity. And to increase the metabolic capacity, the best type of exercise is interval type training. Mm -hmm. But interval type training is high load. And it's hard to accept it. And those coaches who did it, they had much more injuries than coaches who are about concepts. And one, just, I'm allowed to do that. One guy who was a former student of mine is Klopp. Not all teams have this problem with the interval type exercise, but one team from which I know that the number of exercise, of, of injuries is quite high, is the team of Klopp. And Klopp is a former student of myself. I know exactly what he is doing. And he was quite a good student, by the way. And he is doing a lot of this interval exercise. And when I asked him, he said, you get a lot of injuries. He said, of course, I get a lot of injuries. But I have a lot of players. <laughs> and the clubs where I'm a coach, these clubs have enough money to accept enough players. So we don't have, it's not necessary to play with 25, maybe we have 28. So if I lose three, I have still enough. And that's exactly the point. If you have interviews with coaches from soccer clubs, almost no coach says, if you say this make injuries, they said, yeah, could be. It's not my problem. <laughs> if you said, um, can I have the same discussion with your physiotherapist? You, the physiotherapist tells you, I know, I know, but that's my job. Uh, uh, uh. If you said the medical doc of this team says, yes, yes, but this is my job, I earn money with that. And the only one who says, oh, 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 listen, what's the problem here is the management. The management says, it costs money. Right. The other ones say, well, as long as we're winning. <laughs> it, 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 it's like generals in a war. They lose a lot of soldiers. Yes, they lose, but they are winning. Interesting. So I remember also in, in Stuttgart, you said that because um, what those coaches, uh, when they come bring their teams in a weight room, they actually want to try to replicate the movements that are done on the field or on the court or whatever sport they play in. So they do a lot of like quarter squats or half squats. And I remember you said that when you actually are doing quarter squats or half squats, you increase the risk of injury and you should only do full squats. Is, is that true? Is, is there a place in a training program or training cycle to do a quarter squat or half squat? Or if you can do a full squat, you should, you should always do a full squat. It's a very 
a very old and very famous question I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm asked this for 30 years. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> it was one of the first get in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the late 70s they asked me and still nowadays and you do this also. So the recommendation would be nowadays that you say if you have five sets with squats, one should be a deep one. At least. At least. And the background is, from scientific point of view, quite clear. If you, um, if you have a deep squat, you have stimuli for the whole length of the muscle. If you, let's say, have a half squat or a quarter, the problem is that only an overlap of the sarcomeres of some muscle fibers are working, and only those will build new ones. And the problem then is, that if you have a situation in the match where you go down or you are pushed down from another uh, player or something else, in that case the risk of injury is much higher. So it doesn't play a role because you have to, if you make these five sets right. with one full one, or let's say two of these five are full ones, then you have made a good job and you have done something to prevent an injury. Because, um, I asked that question also because uh, I remember you telling me the story that about Valery Bosov and the yeah. Munich Olympics and you actually you actually were there and he actually he spoke to you because um, that's that's the story we tell at our uh, seminars because that's, that's for as, as far as my knowledge goes this was the first documented uh, or first uh, documented uh, Mm, example of post-activation potentiation. Uh, so when yeah. he actually did a squat and then he went... Uh, a deep squat with 180 kilos. Yeah, can you tell the and story? And then he goes out and was sitting down mm -hmm. to start. And uh, that's it's, um, uh, a point of warming up. That's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a strength training. Mm -hmm. it's a, a, he did it as a strength training also. But what he, what I was quoting, and what you mentioned now, is a warming up procedure and that means if you have an explosive high contraction maybe two or three not more then your nervous system is activated to produce high frequency input to the muscle and that's a warming up and um, a really good other example is bobsleigh mm -hmm. The start for bobsleigh in Lillehammer, the German team won the gold medal in the fourth bob. And they, you see all the others were standing aside the starting situation and they were making <coughs> stretchings. And I told our team avoid, in any case, avoid any stretching because stretching makes you slow. Just the opposite of that, what we discussed in the moment. I said, you go back in the lorry, in the track, at the wall we have fixed something, you make explosive contractions, and then you go out and you start with your bob. Mm -hmm. And they won the gold medal by difference of two milliseconds, two and a half milliseconds, something like that. And that's exactly what you say for things like that. It's okay. It works. It's absolutely clear. So going back to uh, Valery Bosov, he did one set of three repetitions at 180 yes. kilos of Only full squat. Three, three reps, full squat. That's it. Three full squat. And it was a full squat, not a quarter squat or no, a half squat. A full squat. <laughs> He was sitting down. Because <laughs> <laughs> some people would say, okay, running, you never go into a deep knee flexion, but you actually do when in the transition phase. Yeah, but the running, idea is yeah. you come out from the block. Yeah. And then you have a, a lot of flexion in the knees and in the hip also. Mm -hmm. down. Yeah. And that could make a difference. Yeah. That could be that small difference yeah. that wins him a gold medal. That's interesting. So no, you use, it, Nowadays, you win a race, you win also because it's checked with the films, with high-speed films, you, you win a, uh, a race with milliseconds also. Mm. I, I remember 50 kilometers cross-country skiing, 50 kilometers, and they, the, the winner was faster half a second, 500 milliseconds. 
Well, <laughs> everything can make a difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah of course. Um, I remember. I mean, twelve years later, Ben Johnson actually did the same thing. Because the first thing, first time I heard about post-activation potentiation was the story of Ben Johnson and Charlie yeah. Francis in '84, when he actually also did a squat before he ran um, yeah. for a gold medal. Obviously, there were some other specific <laughs> things going on there, but before that, I, I, after I read about Bernd Johnson, I read about Valerie Bosov, yeah. which was the first one in 72, so even 12 years before that, and probably he wasn't even the first one. There's probably some people that did that before, right? Or I'm not sure, yeah. but I, I remember that I discussed this with Charlie Francis one, one and a half year before the Olympics in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. I was invited to Canada from the Canadian Coaching Association and we were in Mount St. Marie, this is uh, at the east coast, up in the hills, and there was, um, for the Canadian coaches, there was a strength training seminar and we discussed it, I know that. Uh, and, and this was what I mentioned yesterday, this was the discussion also with Charlie Francis with the medicaments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, um, Going back, I want to touch on something that's um, also controversial, uh, controversial, especially uh, in Poland, because you said about stretching, and I want to touch on about about foam rolling. And remember, you said yeah. foam rolling actually increases uh, scar tissue in the body. Can you talk about more about that? Is is it beneficial to foam roll at all? We should just throw the, all the foam rollers out because uh, there was a big trend about fo uh, foam rolling. Nowadays, people are like kind of going away from it and not foam rolling anymore. But there was a time where everyone was form rolling, all the professional teams, athletes, all they did was form roll. Now it's, it's less and less, but still there are some advocates and even they have workshops about form rolling and things like that. So I want to hear your story about so that. The form rolling is a typical example of how to make money in a short time. And uh, in, in Germany, I know they call it black roll. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and it was, it was a, rubber, a rubber roll. Yeah. Uh, you, you can move. And the, the diameter of 8 to 10 centimeters right. and 30 centimeters long. Mm -hmm. And the price was between 25 and 30 euros for such a thing. And uh, 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 my grandpa would have said, take a piece of wood. <laughs> it makes exactly the same and the price is next to nothing. <laughs> so that, that's one point, one, one aspect of the whole story. The second one and probably the more important is if you, if you move the roll along the muscle on the surface of a cutaneous surface, the problem is you, you are going along the, the vessels also. So uh, you have arterial vessels and you have venous vessels. And the venous vessels close. So if you go in the direction where the blood flow is coming from periphery back to central and you go with a roll, you move the blood inside these vessels in the correct direction. If you go the other way around, you destroy this and then you have to rebuild it. So maybe this is good for some stretching, but you have a risk that you have a problem with the vessels afterwards. And then the point comes up, wh wh why don't you do a stretching as you did it all the time? Mm -hmm. If you need it. Stretching, the stretching is an interesting problem. Because a lot of people need a prolongation of the proteins and if you work always in a in a shortened situation the muscle shortens the proteins also and that's the reason why the soccer players have to do something for avoid hamstring problems stretching would be okay but stretching should not be done as a warm-up before the exercise stretching should be done either at the end or in a different session, not before, mm -hmm. because it makes you slow. And it, instead of, of paying a lot of these roles, you make it as you did it before all the time, it works. That's yeah. for sure. <laughs> That's okay. 
And it even works better when you have changes in the temperature. So hot bath, cold bath, changing, and then you do this is mm -hmm. a part of the rehab. Right. That works. That's okay. We don't need these rolls. Why? And and also, isn't it true that if you work agonistic muscles with antagonistic on the same training session, you in the full range of motion, you don't really need stretching because you that's work. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's true. So is it good to pair? For example, if you do it squats to do a hamstring cross yeah. as a superset, would you do that? I have a famous pupil, Klaus Wirt. He's now a professor at Vienna. Mm -hmm. He showed this very clearly that if you do in the same workout flexes and extensors, you can avoid any stretching work. It's not necessary to have that. Provided you work in a full range of motion. Yeah, that's yeah. A, yeah of course. Yeah. Of course, yes. And you should do that anyway. Yeah. Because, <laughs> I mean, you're, uh, I don't, I mean, you've been around for so many years and you've met all these people that, coaches that I learned from, that everyone that is interesting in strength training should be reading from, like in the famous books uh, by Verkashansky, Jachorsky, Siv, Bompa, Komi, Matveyev. Like, yeah. you've met most of those people. Is, is that correct? Bompa uh, was yeah. in. Pompa was in my uh, home for three or four days mm -hmm. there before he goes to Australia mm -hmm. and uh, when he started to to develop some ideas about block exercises things like that mm -hmm. he was at Freiburg really? University at my home and then I met him later on in Canberra mm -hmm. also in Australia Tsakorsky, Vashashansky um, the first time I met Tsakorsky was in 1980 mm -hmm. And at that time, conferences were just different than we have it nowadays. If, if nowadays you have a conference about sports science, you have maybe 1,500, 1,600 participants. Mm -hmm. in, in the early 80s, it was totally different. In the early 80s, the German government, for example, invited 30, 30 famous scientists from all over the world. Really? And we had not a two-day session, we had a five-day session. <laughs> we had a fancy hotel, we had nice meals, no money. No, 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 don't earn anything. You had a good living, but enough time to discuss all the ideas from all sides. And um, for me, it was, it was funny that Tchaikovsky, uh, he said he, oh, he, he was able to speak English. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he denied to speak a single word in German. <laughs> and later on I learned this from other Russian guys also, neurophysiologists I was mm -hmm. working together with, and no one could speak German. But after 1992, mm -hmm. after the breakdown of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. all all are able to speak German. <laughs> Excellent. Right. And they said, hey, whoa, 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 why, why can you? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> in our family, we do this since mm -hmm. hundreds of years because it's quite clear. They said at that time, the people uh, to European universities, and in that case, where, where are you going? If, if you're coming from Ukraine or, mm -hmm. or uh, let's say, from Lettland and, and mm -hmm. Latif Latifia or, or Russia or whatever, mm -hmm. where, where should you go? You go to, to universities either in, in Poland or in Germany and they speak traditionally, right. they speak German. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. I mean, because I remember, uh, I want to mention, uh, like Charles Poliquin used to say that I mean, he learned, he actually learned when he was young, he learned German because yeah. all the best journals and studies were in German. Yeah. And then he also was talking about Finland a lot and Pavel yeah. Komi. So he, he mentioned Germany and Finland as the top two of his, yeah. the, the countries that he actually taught that had the best studies and, and yeah. a lot to learn from. And you spent so a lot of time with Pavel Komi as well, right? Pavel Komi was one year in my, in my lab in Freiburg. Mm -hmm. I met him 1980 together with Stokowski. Mm -hmm. And then he decided to come, he was from 1984, he was for one year at Freiburg University. Mm -hmm. And um, we did a lot of studies 
with him. And then I invite, he invited me to Jeveskile, I was then also in Finland, and we had strong contacts till he, he died two years ago. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, up to that time, he, he was invited all, all the time and, and he invited me. We traveled around, we have been in South, South America together mm -hmm. and in Australia and in other places. Yeah, because I mean, you've been you've been in a lot of countries because of what yes, you do. I mean, yes, yes. you've been involved in a lot of Olympic right. Olympic games. And can you mention some of the Olympic games you've been around? No, or? no, the yeah. Olympics. I've only mm. been in twice Olympics, and was was not uh, very enthusiastic about that. Mm -hmm. The problem is uh, very ridiculous. But if you are invited, you you get tickets for one or two events. Mm -hmm. And you cannot decide which event, <laughs> which one. So I, I, I'm not interested in when the ladies make water ballot. Mm -hmm. That's nice, nice ladies. <laughs> That's it. But it's not necessary to go to the Olympics right. for that. So um, even in bobsleigh, we, we had a, more than 15 years. We, we had contact with the with a bobsleigh and we make the strength training for the German bobsleigh team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they won, they win a lot of gold medals. And when they were close to Frankfurt, it's Winterberg in the middle of Germany. It's only maybe one and a half hour by car from my home. I was invited for three days for mm -hmm. the world championship in bobsleigh. Right. After the first day, I, I took the car, I go <coughs> home. And I spent the day on the TV <laughs> because I could see all. Right. If you're standing right, you see, zzz, <laughs> that's it. That's it. So what, why? Yeah, it's better to watch on TV. Yeah, of course. <laughs> because the contact with the athletes and the coaches you had before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and later on again, you have them. So I, I have two more like training yeah. questions and two more like life questions that I have left. So uh, going back to muscle fiber type, obviously the best way to check would be muscle biopsy. Um, but that's, is that correct? I mean, is I, it's, not everyone has the resources to do that. I know you and Pavel Komi were able to uh, yeah. test some subjects, but is there a test? Because, I mean, Charles Poliquin and Fred Hatfield and Arthur Jones said that you can actually take 85% of your max and do as many reps as possible. If you do more than six, you're more slow twitch. If you do less than six, you're more fast twitch. Is that, is that true? Can you test like that, like a more in a practical setting, or is it not useful to even do that? Let's come to the first part of your question. Uh, if you if you are able to do biopsies, then the first critical point is normally it's not allowed. Mm -hmm. The ethical commission would say no. So, but you you say okay, I make it private. Mm -hmm. You are free free people, you can do whatever you want. But the problem is, even then, you have a sample which is very small compared to the whole mass of the muscle. And the question comes up, how precise is it? So, a simple problem would be, you take not one biopsy, you take two from the same muscle, one beside the other. Mm -hmm. And then you compare how What's the, if the result from the first biopsy and what's the result from the second biopsy? Are, are they telling you the same story mm -hmm. or are they different? They could be different. Yeah. They only 50% <laughs> are the same. Well. So let's say, okay, maybe even it costs a lot of money. It would be better to go for another impression. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned some people who gave recommendations and at least you can work like that mm -hmm. it's it's a rough it's a very rough estimation mm -hmm. but finally it is an estimation and i wouldn't i wouldn't sign a paper where you say you can detect with this mm -hmm. the fiber type i would sign a paper where standing if you do this you have a rough estimation if this person is fast or not, Slotage. but not why. Mm -hmm. Not why. Right. It could be due to the nervous system. It could be due to the muscle fiber distribution. It could be due 
that a specific muscle fiber shows more mass and more hypertrophy than another one. Mm -hmm. But then to go back to this single, why? We, we, if, if you listened yesterday and you listened in Stuttgart also, you see there are more than a dozen of influencing factors. Yeah. And overall, overall what we measure outside of our body is an effect of a mixture of all these dozen influencing factors. Why should we focus on a single one? Mm -hmm. Doesn't play a role. Yeah. I mean, if it helps the athlete, uh, give him a clap and said, hey, you are as fast as no one all over the world, so he will be happy. Right. But if it's true or not, that's a different thing. So from from scientific point of view, I would say, uh, check if it's fast or not. That's okay. Right. And maybe an interesting point is, if you can do <coughs> more repetitions with the same percentage of load than another people could do, that was the recommendation of the mm -hmm. colleagues. Right. In that case, you say, okay, that shows me that are more resources I can activate. Mm -hmm. And that's the important result, not the fiber type. Right. So you could, you, could, you could technically, like for example, have a person that's more slow twitch, but it's actually more fast and explosive than the person who's fast twitch, but not as fast as explosive, because the muscle fiber type is not the only factor that influences right. speed and power and all right. that stuff. Right. It all depends on nervous system uh, and training you, and everything. I give you an example yesterday that people are world champ during exercise and when they are in competition, they're not able yeah. to produce these fast uh, contractions they should have. Mm -hmm. It's a psychological problem. Right. And in most of the sports, in most of the sports, there are other things. If you, 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 you I, I remember a German rower. He was the world best rower, um, and in the skiff, in the in the single boat, mm -hmm. and he he wants to become an Olympic gold medal in any case. So he had a psychological coach, and this coach said, "Okay, every morning." when you go for fresh socks, when you go for fresh clothing, mm -hmm. there are small papers inside, and on these papers standing, you are the fastest, you are the biggest, you are the world next world champ, that's for mm -hmm. sure. So, his name was Kolbe, the rower, mm -hmm. not the psychologist. <laughs> I don't mention the psychologist. <laughs> Kolbe was his name. And Kolbe was then finally, in the last, in the final race, he was that fast from the beginning that he had five lengths in front, 200 meters before the end of the race. And then he had a breakdown. Right. An overestimation <laughs> of your own capacity. Right. He, he, he was strong, he was fast, he was all fine. But from a psychological point of view, he wasn't. it was a disaster. <laughs> And that's exactly that. Or you can prepare someone, and you can make him fast, and, and give him really good, a good equipment. Mm -hmm. But finally, all things must come together. Right. So, um, I just talking about uh, being fast and and development speed. I just want to go back to uh, rate of force development, mm -hmm. and a lot of coaches, a lot of players, and athletes believe that. To be fast, you have to move weight fast. So therefore, you have to work at low intensity, like 50%, 30%, 60%. But when you get to a higher intensity, like 80, 90, 100%, just because the weight is moving slow, they think they're going to get slow. And that's not the case. Because, I mean, you said the only way to actually develop rate of force development is at high loads, not small loads with fast velocity. Is that correct? It's not the only way, mm -hmm. but it's a prerequisite mm -hmm. requisite for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, to being fast, first of all, you need a high rate of force development. Mm -hmm. And to get, 
to develop, to develop the highest rate of force development, you have to make explosive contractions against high loads. That was the movement of the mm -hmm. ball right. we discussed before. Another influencing factor is the interaction. It's a coordination problem of the muscle mm -hmm. you use for that movement, right. of course. And that's a coordination problem. So if, if you want to have a very fast movement, not a very fast contraction velocity, a very fast movement velocity, in that case, you have to move fast, extremely fast, right. and, not, and not an average with a little bit of load. So, or you use exactly the load you have in the competition or in your sports or discipline. Mm -hmm. That's for true. Mm -hmm. But this is not a strength training. It's a coordination training. Right. So because, I mean, a lot of, a lot of athletes or coaches believe that, like, let's say we, have, we train some boxers and, and coaches would stop all strength training a month before f a fight. Like, and I tell them, like, it's, you should be working up until the fight pretty much and I give him example of of Valerie Bosov or Ben Johnson like because if you have high loads and you do low volume uh, this is actually beneficial then just then they usually they just stop strength training altogether a few weeks before competition and all they do is like med ball throws and jumps yeah. which is all which is good stuff but the strength training should also be a part of it right I mean, with the low volume high intensity um, low reps yeah. high loads but additionally to what they're doing yeah. as far as speed stuff? There are two aspects. Mm -hmm. Aspect number one, if you do any type of training by which you change something inside the muscle, in that case, you, you should stop the strength training 10 days before the competition. Mm -hmm. not, not, not earlier, 10 days and not later than maximum five or six days because there is time to build mm -hmm. with any type of exercise you destroy some cells right and then you give the body time enough to build new ones mm -hmm. otherwise if you do the exercises till the beginning of the competition then the next five days after competition, you build new cells. Mm -hmm. So you are in the best and the fastest Shit. form when you travel home, right. not for the competition. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is if you use these high explosive contractions, but only maximum three for warming up. That's your mm -hmm. example with Ben Johnson um, or Valerie, Valerie Bosov. In that case, in that case, it's a warming up procedure. Now, could you call it an activation of nervous system? Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, very often, coaches ask me, "Okay, I, I I got it. I understood that I should stop the strength training ten days before competition." I said, "So yeah, what's your problem?" The problem is that my athlete, he becomes nervous. Mm -hmm. Because if I, don't, if I don't do anything more for the last 10 days, maybe I will not be in a top shape. Right. I said, yeah, that's okay. So what you could do, you every three days, you make a strength training workout consisting of one set with only three reps against maximal loads. That's all. Mm -hmm. And you explain that this avoids any reduction of his capability. So the asset is happy, the coach is happy, and you will destroy nothing. Because <laughs> I remember you said, you said that it takes five to six days to rebuild the cells and the muscle fibers. And I remember... Uh, Charles Palaquin used to do uh, like a two week overload. Uh, he called it like a super accumulation yeah. training where he did two weeks of high uh, volume training and, and, and he stopped a week before Olympics. And then the athletes have their week to actually rebuild new cells and then they were in top form 
at the Olympics. And like you said, if you do it too late, if you stop too late, you're actually in top form after a competition. So is that correct? Yeah, yeah it's, co yeah, it's, it's <laughs> not, s not so much difference to that what I told you. Yeah. It, if you repeat this very often, the reaction of your body is faster. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I hear from coaches coming from countries out of Europe, mm -hmm. you can accelerate this process also by using medicaments or something <laughs> like this. Right. Okay. Um, one more, one last story, because uh, it was very interesting, and I wanna, uh, I want you to uh, tell this story to everyone. This is about occlusion training and where it came from and the benefits yeah. of the occlusion training. Can you touch upon the history of occlusion training, like you told me when we were driving in the car? <laughs> <laughs> occlusion training originally is a very old one. And it goes back some hundred years because in that case they were doing this type of, of handling, maybe not exercise, but handling with wounded soldiers on the battlefields. But to make the story shorter, uh, what we nowadays use is knowledge of a uh, uh, Japanese physiotherapist. And he brought this um, 1989 and during the 90s he made a lot of statistics and he said when he glows uh, the blood flow to the muscle he imitates the effect of a hard working. Uh, the background of this is quite clear. If you have a load of 60% and higher, the pressure of the muscle is that high that the blood flow is over. That's the reason why we say strength training starts with 60% of load. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if it's below, you have blood flow. Right. Over 60, the pressure of the muscle avoids any blood flow through the vessels. Okay. And now you said, I avoid this also when I fix mm -hmm. and I, 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 I suppress the blood flow then for the muscle exists the idea it's the same as having no blood flow. Right. And th th the point of that is quite true that specific um, adaptations you can see if you do that. And the practical point of view is nice idea, but there are several buts. But number one is, uh, it works only in that muscle where you have no blood flow. Okay. So you can do it with the right arm, you can do it with the left arm, you can do it with the right leg, you can do it with the left leg, and then uh, you can you're not able to do it with the head. <laughs> Otherwise, it's all over. <laughs> to be more precise is. If, if you suppress the blood flow and you will do this efficiently, then efficiently to do it on the different joints. Mm -hmm. And we should decide which type of occlusion you have. The Japanese guy, he said the interruption is 130 millimeters Hg. It's not a total blood flow interruption. A total blood flow interruption we have with 300. If you have a totally interruption of blood flow mm -hmm. after some minutes you kill the system. And if you do this, let's say for about 20 minutes, your extremity is white <laughs> because it's dead. Right. And that's not the intention of the whole story. So if we speak about blood flow, we speak about reduction of blood flow 
in the mm -hmm. whole system. So occlusion means not a totally occlusion. It means occlusion by 70 or 80 percent. Okay. And that it's good for a faster regeneration after injury for that single muscle who has a problem. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's the idea why these Japanese physiotherapists work like that. Because you said, I mean, didn't you say that in the Civil War when they actually did the occlusion, there were penicillin the worms? That are yes. Civil, yeah. Yes. They, they, they saw that inside the open wound uh, situation, they had these worm, they found these worms and they produce penicillin. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. But the, the development, how it works and how to produce it was in the late 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was developed finally for, for using in the 30s. That was the reason why the American army, they had this, but not the German ones. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have last two questions uh, for you. I mean, obviously you had a lot of mentors in your life. You had to have to, to get to the point where you, where, uh, you are now. Um, but if you, can, if you could have coffee with anyone in the world, alive or dead, historical figures or one of your old mentors, who would you have coffee with and why? You can pick anyone in the world ever that ever lived. <laughs> I think you... you this is a very difficult question, and <laughs> there is you can no you can pick two people. You can pick two no, people. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. And there's there is no correct answer mm -hmm. because every day you have some other ideas, you have some other interests, and um, there were a lot of very interesting people, and a lot of things. I would say, to be honest. I would not like to miss anything because you learn a lot and most people think that you can learn a lot uh, if you have contact with very famous people or uh, well-known people or top athletes or Olympic winners or what else. I think at least, at least you learn the same amount of new knowledge from people who make mistakes. Because from learning mistakes, you know exactly what you should change in the future. If you have a, a nice discussion with the very famous people and you say, I have the same ideas than you, you stand up, you had a nice coffee, and what's new? Nothing. Right. <laughs> so, learning from mistakes is much more useful. It, maybe you can be a little bit proud if the other guy said, I had the same idea, I had the same result. You know, that was not th the wrong direction. Right. But that's it. And um, therefore, in some, of the, in some of the situations, you see that things making sense and others not so much so you learn along the way yeah you yeah. okay you, you you get some impressions and these impressions say if i for example make uh, presentations for coaches in europe in the western country in high developed Eastern countries, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. If I do the same in a country where the society and the whole situation is not developed, the question comes up, what, what for? Right. If you do this, let's say, I have been several times in, in Africa, mm -hmm. so in Uganda, and uh, if, if you make a presentation like I did it here in Uganda, the question comes up, who has a benefit of that? <laughs> Every family yeah. has, they, the 80%, 80% of the, of the people 
are younger than 18 years. Right. And the average, the average family has between six and eight children. And then the father of the family tells you that from these eight children, he can pay for two children to send them at school. And the other six not. Why should I tell them story about how to develop a, a, a better performance? Right. The, the point should be how can they survive? <laughs> and not how to become world champs. Right. True. Well, if you could go back in time and tell something to our 15 or 20 year old Dietmar, what would you tell him? Life advice, training, <laughs> what would you say or what would you do different or how would you, what, what advice would you give him if you could just go back and meet yourself when you were 15 or 20 years old? Is there something you would change or tell him, tell yourself? Mm. Of course you have in, if you're young, you have other ideas, then the situation comes up later. Right. And uh, nowadays, it's quite clear, you can have wishes and you can make decisions. And during lifetime, this changes all the time. So you will never have only one job. You will have a lot of jobs nowadays. You will have a lot of different things. and. Um, So the question should be, is there any situation in which you nowadays would decide to change the direction? And would you? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, from my perspective, I always think of it, yeah, right now, I think I would go different, but at that time, I made the best decision yeah. at that time that I believe that was the best decision at that time. And obviously when you, you learn later or a few years after that, you'd be like, hey, I, I could have done that. But it's not like you made a bad decision on purpose. You made the best decision that you could at that time. And if it was good or bad, you just find out later. Uh, so I think regretting stuff and then thinking that oh, I should have done that and this, like nobody actually makes their life hard on purpose. It just happens that sometimes you make decisions yeah, that make right. your life harder or better, but you can't. Sometimes, with that. sometimes the type of, of education and the, 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 the knowledge you are working for stays the same. But if I go back, I said, after my, my studies, I studied uh, physical education, history, and German language. And I want to become a teacher in a high school. And Finally, my professor said, hey, you should write a thesis. So I was working for adaptation of the nervous system, the muscular system. Some medical docs were coming saying, yeah, I'm interested in what you're doing. So you should go to the, to the neurophysiology. You should work in the neurophysiology center. And then I was invited to take part in the best German research community. And you get a lot of money, you get a lot of knowledge, you get a lot of, of, of Mm -hmm. things and you were interested to improve the capability of people and then in the 90s for example when high performance sport has not the high ranking in politics anymore because the cold war was over then you learned that much more benefit of that what you know and what you advice you can give is better when you do this for the patients and not for the athletes. What's true for the athletes, it's fine. It's still working, it's okay. But you can, with a small transfer, you can offer the same for the patients. Not only for the two dozen of gold medal winners, right. also for thousands of people. There's a lot of benefit for this with the same knowledge. So you know the same, you have learned the same, but the interpretation was different then. And you were working then in a different area, which was of a lot of interest. Right. Because you again learned, oh, 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 and this, and this, and so on, and so on. And that's exactly what nowadays makes sense 
that your knowledge is good enough to overcome the area in which you have learned it. You have also to look to the areas around and a lot of medical docs can learn a lot from high performance sports and they can learn even more from exercise physiology. Right. And if you ask a normal medical doc how to develop a nervous system, how to develop the muscle, he, he knows probably 30% of that what a good coach is knowing. Right. Even a physiotherapist knows more than a medical doc, normally, except he's working in, in this topic. Right. Okay. Well, it's been uh, it's been a real pl pleasure for me to uh, have you here, and, and thank you for doing a seminar. Thank you for doing this podcast, and it's um, it's it's this dream come true for me to meet you and, and finally have you here. It's been it's been a few years. We've been trying to get you to come here, and finally it happened. Hopefully, we can do a part two in the future because I I mean I feel like I could talk to you forever for hours and hours because of so many stories and obviously the knowledge you have it's it's uh it's it's very vast and and great so uh, like i said it's, it's been a pr pleasure professor and hopefully uh we do part two in the future thanks a lot it was a pleasure for me too <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs>